Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, perfect T embeddings uh, in two uh, special cases. So uh, in this talk, I'll give a brief definition of the diamond model and brief discussion of what's known and of what we're trying to achieve. And then I'll introduce and define uh, perfect T embeddings of bipartite graphs. Uh, and then I'll talk about perfect T embeddings of Aztec diamond graphs and perfect T embeddings of a different uh, set of graphs called tower graphs. And then I'll uh, yeah, show some pictures and discuss some future, future directions. So first, our model, we've seen it many times. So uh, for the diamond model, we start with a bipartite graph with edge weights, which is planar. Uh, and we study a probability measure on perfect matchings where the probability of a matching uh, is proportional to the product of its edge weights. Okay. And this normalization is called the partition function. So our goal is to understand the asymptotic behavior of the model. So here we have two uh, pictures of random, randomly sampled perfect matchings on large uh, periodic, uh, large finite pieces of periodic graphs. So on the left we have a large piece of the square lattice called the Aztec diamond. And we sort of colored the different types of edges in a fundamental domain like this. So you can view it as a tiling in this way. And that's what the uh, colors are. And then here this is an example of a tower graph. So it's sort of built out of alternating columns of, uh, square, of uh, hexagons and squares, which sort of interlace in a particular way sort of an Aztec diamond-like domain. And this picture is, uh, this is a big version of this graph, sort of rotated by 90 degrees. Okay, so anyway, so in the Darwin model, our goal is to analyze asymptotic behavior. And many people have discussed limit shapes and arctic curves. So here's an arctic curve and there's a limit shape. And so it's well known that for uh, two periodic graphs, there is a uh, law of large numbers, sort of a geometric law of large numbers, which can be described in terms of the associated random height function. And uh, so that's what we see in this picture, sort of concentration around the surface. And then what we want to do is, is we want to study fluctuations around this limit. So it's expected that uh, these are given by some Gaussian field. And uh, the exact uh, covariance structure, uh, there's sort of a pre precise conjecture of Kenny and Nukonkov about the covariance structure of this field. So, so the goal is to uh, the goal is to right. So the goal is to develop techniques to, to give a, a general proof of this. That's like the long term goal. Okay. So uh, one uh, sort sort of a very important object in the study of the Darwin model is the Castellan matrix, which again has been uh, introduced many times. So, in order to define a Castellan matrix, one has to first choose a Castellan sign, uh, which can be a unit length complex number on each edge such that the alternating product around a face of these signs, like this, is plus or minus one, depending on the number of edges around the face. Right. And then so if we have a Castellan matrix, so then we can build this matrix, where if WB is an edge, then that entry of the matrix uh, has, uh, is equal to like the sign times the edge weight. Uh, so it's uh, an old theorem that we can compute the partition function of the model as a determinant if we have this matrix. And also, uh, we can also compute statistics of the diamond model if we can compute the inverse. So if we can invert this matrix, we can compute all the statistics that we care about. Uh, okay, so now I'll talk about perfect T embeddings. So uh, T embeddings were introduced in, uh, under the name of circle patterns in this work of Kenyon, uh, Ruskik, and Ramasamy, and, uh, and one other author. Lamp. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. Lamp. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then uh, they're also introduced in this work of Chelcock, Lasse, and Ruskik under the name of T embeddings, and then perfect T embeddings, which is a special type of T embedding. It's a T embedding with special boundary condition. Was introduced in this uh, follow-up work of Chelcock, Lasse, and Ruskik. Okay. So first, I, before I give a precise definition, I just want to give a high-level overview. So T embeddings are a new type of graph embedding. Of a, uh, associated to a bipartite graph, and they, in a geometric way, encode the data of the edge weights of the underlying Daimler model. And they also, uh, yeah, they also 
it seems, in a geometric way, encode the boundary condition of the associated Denver model if you fix a finite graph. And so each T embedding has a naturally associated origami map, which we'll define later. And the main result of this work, the second work of Chalkak, Lasse, and Ruskik, states that if we have a sequence of perfect T embeddings, uh, which satisfy three nice properties. So the origami maps converge. Uh, these maps, so there's a T embedding which fills some domain. And the origami map is some complex valued function on this domain. And so if these converge, and if the, the graph of this limiting origami map is a maximal surface in R21, so if it has zero mean curvature in R21, so R3 with ambient metric of signature like plus, plus, minus. And if, in addition, uh, this sequence of embedding satisfies uh, two sort of regularity conditions, then height fluctuations converge to a Gaussian free field in the conformal structure uh, given by the metric of this surface. So you can compute this, the covariance structure of the limiting Gaussian field from this surface, according to this theorem, if you have your sequence of perfect T embeddings. OK, so again, but yeah, before I give a definition, so our goal is to show that in two special cases. So first, our goal is to show that in the case of the Aztec diamond, really all of these, all of these assumptions are satisfied. Uh, so, yeah. so we want to show that all these assumptions are satisfied so that really the techniques uh, of, this pre of the previous work lead to a new proof uh, of Gaussian fluctuations. And then we sort of uh, compute some things in that other example of tower graphs. Okay, so now I want to define T embedding. So first, in order to give a definition, I need to first say what uh, gauge equivalent edge weights are. So recall that we have our Boltzmann measure defined from the edge weights. And we say that two uh, sets of edge weights are gauge equivalent if they're related to each other uh, in this way for two real valued functions, f on black vertices and g on white vertices. So in other words, gauge equivalent weight functions are obtained from one another by a sequence of local operations where we multiply all edges around a vertex by the same constant, c. So it's sort of easy to see that this won't affect this Boltzmann measure. Boltzmann measures invariant under these gauge transformations. So gauge equivalent weight functions have the same uh, Dimer model. Okay, so now I can define what a T embedding is. So a T embedding is an embedding of the dual graph, which satisfies the, the property that the uh, lengths of dual edges give a set of edge weights which are gauge equivalent to the original edge weights on the bipartite graph. So these sort of geometrically defined uh, edge weights, so this is an edge in the primal graph, and then I take the length of the corresponding edge in the dual graph, having trouble pointing, then uh, that is, that should be, those should be gauge equivalent to the original edge weights. And also there's an angle condition. So around each dual vertex, the sum of angles around white faces should be pi. And similarly, the sum of angles, so of course then, sum of angles, because it's an embedded graph, so sum of angles around black faces should be pi. So that's what a T embedding is. Okay, so just uh, maybe just this is partially to some extent this is just like a comment uh, to maybe just clarify uh, the definition a little bit. So these two properties, if I just forget about the fact that if I just forget about the requirement that it should be embedded, then these two uh, properties of a T embedding are equivalent to the existence of complex valued gauge functions, F on black vertices and G on white vertices such that if I take the uh, dual edge of, it, of an embedding, if I take its length together with this complex argument, then it's just, uh, it's given by multiplying the Castellan matrix, that corresponding entry of the Castellan matrix by these two uh, functions, f and g. So the, the dual edges of the T embedding just give you a, a new gauge of a Castellan matrix. So here k is, is unsigned. Here, what's that? Unsigned, right? It's yes. Just, just the weights. It's just like, it's like plus minus one. It's like, uh, I think it's signed, signed because the argument of the complex ways they are signed. K, K, K is real signed. Yeah, sorry. So K should be like real value. So we start with a. Oh, well, but, but signed. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it should be real valued. So it's like we fix the Castellan matrix just like combinatorially on our original graph, and then it's real valued, and then this gives us, uh, so this gives us a, a T embedding. But can, can, can you always pick a, uh, <coughs> signs for the bipartite graph? 
I think so, yes, I think so, yes, yes. Uh, so, um, right, so the existence of F and G is equivalent to this angle condition satisfied by the uh, uh, T embedding. Uh, oh, right, not equivalent, right. So, but F and G exists because, of, right, 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 right. So F and G exists because, of, right. So, okay, so the other requirement is that F and G should be in the kernel of the castling matrix. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now uh, I should define, I need to define the associated uh, origami map. So uh, first, we, uh, so the origami map is sort of defined on the union of faces of the embedding. It's a complex valued function. So first we fix a reference face, W naught, which is fixed by the origami map. So the origami map is identity map on this, uh, on this little yeah, triangle here in this case. And then to define its value at another face, I pick a path in the, in the uh, so in the primal graph, which is the dual of this picture. So I pick a path from this face to the reference face and I reflect this face across each edge that I cross in the path. So I apply that sequence of reflections. And so it sort of maps this face like isometrically to some copy of it, to some copy of itself over here. And, um, right, and so I chose a path, so I need to say that it's uh, path independent, but this angle condition guarantees that this is uh, actually path independent. So we're going to map uh, defined in this way is well defined. Question. Yes. Yes. In the pictures which you're, which you're showing us, everything is checkerboard color. Do you need that condition, or does it follows from somewhere? No. So we're assuming the graph is like bipartite. Yeah. So this is the dual graph of a bipartite graph. So the face of the graph. dual graph. Of yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So we're embedding the dual graph. Yes. Yeah. Right. But you did, you didn't say what is the order coming map, right? It maps. It's a it's complex valued function of faces, right? Yeah, on the, un on the union of faces, that's right. Right, so how do you define it on that face that you reflected? Uh, so like if I, I take this point here and I apply that sequence of reflections and I end up somewhere and that's the origami map. So the origami map is not a priori defined like combinatorially, it's, like, it's a map on the, uh, I mean it is defined combinatorially, but it's also a map, the way I'm defining now, it's just a map on this domain here. So it moves every face into yes. the other position? Yes, that's right. And so the value on that face would be that, like it would set all these all these points in the black into that place in the white, right? Yeah, I mean it won't necessarily actually like overlap with this white face, but it'll just send it to some some copy of that triangle. Purple one on the picture. And for black, it changes orientation. For white, it doesn't change orientation yeah. because even over a number of flips. Yes. Is it well defined at the vertices? Yes. Because it's not clear. I mean. The points which belong to several triangles, then the image depends on which. Yeah, that's right. But then, like the reflection, so I can either do this reflection or not, and it sort of won't move me. Where defined up to this all the square, the word defined will always is not word defined. I'm sorry. Say it one more time. All squared is word defined, but always not word defined. Oh. Always well. Oh, always well defined. Always well defined. Okay. Yeah, I, I know what you're thinking of, but yeah, always well defined. Yeah. Oh, well. so it's origami. You take the you take the picture you see. You fold along all the edges by 180 degrees, and it collapses everything onto a smaller region. That's right. But you work with a piece of paper, which a priori can self intersect. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but it's a continuous path. Right. It is a piecewise linear, also. Yes, uh, yeah, but yeah, that's so it's a symmetric question. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so, um, right, so in terms of these gauge functions, so the embedding is given by these gauge functions, f and g, and in terms of these gauge functions, the differential of the origami map, so the difference between the origami map at this uh, point compared to this point, is given by the same formula except with g conjugated. So that's related to, so you can see this by observing that this also gives you some uh, map where you sort of uh, are gluing every other face with the wrong orientation. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now I need to define this special boundary condition called uh, 
the perfectness. So a perfect T embedding is just, oh, OK. So first, I should say how we even deal with the boundary at all. So we have a finite uh, bipartite graph. So, and I didn't explain how we deal with the boundary. So we consider the so-called augmented dual, which is the dual graph together with uh, an extra vertex for each uh, boundary edge of the graph. So there's some outer face of the graph, distinguish outer face, and then there's some, uh, there's some boundary edges. And um, we consider this augmented dual with an extra dual vertex for every one of these edges. And we connect these up, and we connect them to their adjacent interior. There's sort of a unique adjacent interior vertex. Okay, so that's called the augmented dual. That's what we really embed. And we add this extra requirement. So when we embed these vertices, we get this boundary polygon here. And one of the extra requirements for a perfect T embedding is that this boundary polygon is a, is a tangential polygon. Okay, and then the other requirement is that these edges going from boundary vertices to the interior ones uh, are angle bisectors of this polygon. So there's so it should be a, a tangential polygon, and um, this angle bisector condition should be satisfied. So that's a perfect T embedding. Okay, so now I'll talk about uh, a special case. So Aztec diamonds. Okay, so an Aztec diamond is a, is a subset of the square lattice, which looks like this. This is an Aztec diamond of size three. One, two, three. So yeah, this is an Aztec diamond of size three. And here's a perfect matching. We consider the case where we have uniform edge weights on the Aztec diamond. Okay, so we're following a, we follow a construction. So in this paper of Chelcock and Ramasamy, they, they compute some things for perfect T embeddings of the uniform Aztec diamond. So they first give a construction. So uh, first, before I can even talk about the construction a little bit, uh, we actually embed this uh, slightly different graph, uh, which is obtained by contracting degree two vertices on the boundary. So we sort of uh, contract at all these degree two black vertices, and all these are glued together into one vertex. And then similarly here, we contract here and here, so these are all glued together. And then we obtain this graph. And from, the, from a probabilistic perspective, this doesn't change anything because it doesn't change any of, the any of the statistics inside of here. All the edge inclusion probabilities are the same. So uh, it doesn't change anything in the model. And, um, but yeah, now it, it's sort of a simpler graph because it has a degree four outer boundary. And so in the, in the case of the Aztec diamond, there's something called the shuffling algorithm, which allows you to use uh, sort of structure-preserving local moves to build up the graph. Uh, from a size one Aztec diamond. And it's well known that, uh, or it's not, or it's a theorem of uh, that KLLR, KLRR paper, Kenyon, Lamb, Ramasamy, and Ruskik, that uh, T embeddings behave well under these uh, local operations. So there's a corresponding local operation for the T embedding, uh, which uh, preserves, its, preserves the property of it being a T embedding of the graph. So they give a construction of this perfect T embedding, and that's the one that we're also going to study. So in particular, the boundary conditions, there's sort of four outer boundary vertices, here, 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 and here. And they sort of, they just map to the vertices of the square here. One I minus one minus I. Um, so if you, if you specify the exact boundary condition, then it should be uh, unique. But uh, if you uh, right, so if you don't specify a boundary condition, then there should there are some there's some group of symmetries which preserve the property of being a perfect T embedding. Right, so it's not unique. But up to those symmetries, it's expected to be unique. So is it a conjecture or a theorem? Yes, yeah, so that's a conjecture. Yeah, that's a conjecture. Right. It is unique for the outer face of degree four. It is a theorem, but not unique. For <laughs> not, not, did you say not unique or? It is unique up to some transformations. There is a conjecture that is unique up to some Lorentz boosts. Uh, yeah. But for the outer face of degree four, it is unique. Uh, yeah, right, okay. And yeah, so, okay, for the origami map, we choose this uh, face here. So in blue here, we've shown like the, the image of these edges under this folding procedure, uh, which defines the origami map. Uh, and so this is a, yeah, so this is like our reference face for the origami map. Okay, so uh, one of our main results is that we, we give a, 
We give an exact formula describing the position of the embedded dual vertex uh, at position JK of the Aztec diamond. So, okay, so, uh, I guess, yeah, so this is a double contour integral formula. And the point of this, the point of this formula is that it's uh, relatively straightforward to take asymptotics of this formula. So you can study the asymptotics of the embedding at any point in the domain. And, right, okay. And another uh, point about this formula is that um, this function s here, which appears in the exponential, is the same function s that will appear, that appears, for example, in exact formulas for the correlation curve. So what that, the consequence of that is that it becomes uh, very straightforward to connect uh, the embedding to the uh, expected complex structure for the fluctuations. Okay, so, uh, so this is related to what I was just saying. So there's uh, this function s has some, if I fix x and y, this function s has some critical point and it turns out that this function it gives you a diffeomorphism from the disk inscribed in the Aztec diamond to the upper half plane. And this map is sort of the uniformizing map in the uh, conformal structure associated to the Gaussian free field. Okay, and so finally, just to state, uh, to state uh, the next, what, what appears on the next slide, there, uh, just define these two holomorphic functions, rational functions, f and g. So we compute, so this was, this was already computed in Chalcock and Ramasamy's work. We recompute using this formula that uh, uh, the T embedding, the scaling limit of the T embedding uh, has this form, and the scaling limit of the origami map has this form. So uh, this is sort of uh, essentially the same as the Weierstrass parameterization of a maximal surface. So it's sort of easy to see from this that you get, uh, uh, that you indeed get a maximal surface. And so they, are, they also argue this uh, in their work. And this, this parameter zeta here is exactly the uniformizing map to the, uh, okay, I guess that's what I, I guess that's the content of the next slide. Okay, so recall that the theorem of uh, Chalkok, Lasley, and Ruskic states that uh, if these assumptions on perfect T embeddings are satisfied, then height fluctuation should converge to a Gaussian free field in the conformal structure of this surface. Right, and so it's a theorem that in the complex structure defined by this map, uh, the fluctuations in the Aztec diamond are given by uh, uh, a GFF. And this agrees with the conjecture, general conjecture of Kenny and Oconco. And so uh, what we computed uh, and what, they, what was already computed amounts to showing that uh, this diagram commutes. So these two maps from this uh, disk inscribed in the Aztec diamond to the surface and the one defined to the upper half plane define the same complex structure here. So they define the same GFF, which is what we expected. Right. So if the theory works, then this is what we expect. Yes, that's right. So it's exactly that, that pair of uh, integrals, f times g, and then f times g bar. Yeah. That's the map. Yeah, I should have written that. Yeah. So, and that is a conform, the point is that is a conform map. Yeah. Wait, just, could you say it again? So, so the thing on the right is three dimensional, right? The bottom right. Uh, Over here? Yeah. yeah. It's so a, so it's, a, it's a surface. Yeah, yeah. So it's two dimensional. Yeah. Okay, so the image of the upper half plane is, is that surface. That's right, yeah. So the image of the upper half plane under this pair of functions, under this map, is that surface. There are two real numbers. Sorry, so this is complex and this one actually is real. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Complex, complex tells you, tells you the underlying. That's right, yeah. So the R2 and R2-1 the is, and the zeta. that's right. So XY value is, is then, then this, XY is, is the J over N, K over N, right? The, that's the coordinates. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Is it obvious that the third one is real? Yeah, if you write down the, yeah, it is. Uh, so if I, so G bar of Z bar, we'll just change this to a plus. So if I multiply these, uh, 
with that change, then you get like a real, a rational function with real coefficients. And that contour, I didn't say what the contour is, but it's like symmetric around the, so it's kind of obvious that it's real, yeah. That's right. Okay, so the, also I should, I'll comment that the point of writing it, I guess the point of writing it like this is that this is sort of like a limit version of, so like if I sum up, if I want to compute like the change of the embedding between two points, then I should sum up things like f I should sum up things like f times k times g. So this is sort of like a limiting version of that. So there's actually like a concrete sense in which this little f is associated to capital F and little g is associated to little g. And so and you could derive that from that exact formula. But Yes, that's right. That's right. So that map is literally just the composition of these two maps by definition. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to check that the that the that in this sort of simplest non-trivial case of the Aztec diamond that the theory fully works. So we wanted to check all the uh, we wanted to check all these regularity conditions as well in the theorem. And so via this exact formula, we're able to do that. Uh, and in particular, we're able to check that if we stay in the bulk of the, uh, so uh, yeah, the image of the embedding lives in this square. And if we stay in the bulk of the square, then the edge lengths of the embedding are exactly at scale one over n. Right, so up to a constant, they're exactly of size one over n. And the angles of the embedding are bounded away from zero and pi. So this is sort of like a, a rigidity property, like the embedding is very nice if you stay away from the boundary. And okay, so one of these regularity conditions, so we 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 show ultimately that that this that these properties imply, uh, well, these properties plus some mild condition on the image of the embedding imply uh, the regularity conditions which are required for their theorem. Uh, in particular, there's some uh, Lipschitzness of the origami maps. Which is required, so we're able to deduce this from from this. Okay. okay. And yes. Yeah. yes. So um, the origami map in general maps in the plane, right? It has image in the plane. That's right. But it's, at some point, it becomes the image becomes one dimensional. Is that? So yeah, in, in these examples which I'm showing, it turns out that yeah, the image is becoming one dimensional. That's right. Okay. Yes. But in general, I mean, do you know for which graphs? Get one-dimensional. Um, no, no, not exactly. But it, like, it seems like, for example, I'll show a picture at the end. It, it seems like uh, if you have a non-simply connected domain, then uh, yeah. So there's some holes, right? So that uniformizing map is not to a simply connected domain. So uh, it seems like the origami map does not stay real valued in that case generically, yeah. or does not become real valued. Yeah. Yes. When you approach the boundary, your uh, origami constant just goes up to one or goes to one or? When I approach the boundary. Sorry, what do you mean? Uh, you see your, you have oh, yeah. this Say constant. Say your compact gets closer and closer. Um, does, it blow, does it just degenerate there? Yeah, something sort of, yeah, the, the behavior is different at the boundary. So, uh, I mean, if you even go, uh, yeah, like if you go to like a super small scale, then the constant blows up to one anyway, because it's actually locally like an isometry. So if you, if I go inside the same face, then the constant is one. Yeah, I mean this is like say ten delta. Or delta yeah, uh, I think at the boundary. Well, okay, I'm not totally sure. I'm not totally sure, but sort of the local behavior is different at the boundary. Yeah, it's different. Right. So like this 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 would actually be different at the boundary, for example. Okay, so uh, so we also study uh, another sequence of graphs which are similar to similar to Aztec diamonds, uh, called tower graphs. So as I said, they're sort of sort of obtained by stacking uh, hexagons and then two layers of squares, and a layer of hexagons, and so on, with sort of an interlacing pattern like this. And you can check that it's possible to contract degree two vertices along the boundary in a similar way. 
uh, to obtain a degree four outer boundary, a graph with degree four outer boundary. And uh, so, okay, this is just a picture of how we index the faces of this graph with pairs of integers. And then here's an example of a perfect T embedding. And here's the folded up graph according to the origami map. Yes, that's right, folded up to like the top right. So this is like the reference face over here, yeah. Okay, and okay. So we're embedding this reduced tower graph over here. Okay, and so we sort of work out, in order to do this, first we sort of work out a shuffling algorithm, sort of work out the combinatorial details of this, in particular sort of like the details of the boundary of the shuffling algorithm, uh, which allows to build up a tower graph inductively using these local moves and therefore build up uh, a T embedding inductively. So there's sort of like two rounds of spider moves which allows you to get to one size larger. So there is no general theorem that says that these embeddings exist? Right, yeah, so there's no general theorem, yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh. I'll comment on that a little bit. There's no general theorem. It's just a dream. <laughs> that they exist, yeah. Right. I mean, so like maybe I can say like, you can count parameters and uh -huh. it seems like it should exist, but yeah, there's no theorem. They're not, you cannot construct them just as minimizers of some. Right, so I mean, that would energy. be, no, yeah, it's not known how to do it, but that would be like a really nice, I mean, obviously that would be really nice. But there's no known way of doing that. Right. It's a conjecture at the moment. That they exist. Yeah. Right, that's right. Right, that's right. Is the hard part the perfect? Uh, I mean, without the perfect assumption? Um, even without the perfect assumption, like, Again, sort of uh, by like roughly speaking, by like parameter counting, it's, they exist. I guess it's like strictly speaking, it's a theorem, although you don't know that it would be embedded, the one that you got. So the immersion, immersions always exist, right? That, that's right, yeah. But like how to compute them is not, uh, is not known. There's no like variational argument, even if you drop the perfectness. Right. Um, Okay, so it's, it's also known on this sequence of graphs called tower, on this uh, sequence of tower graphs that the height fluctuations here inside this liquid region are converging to a Gaussian free field. And uh, there's some uniformizing map, so there's some complex structure associated to this GFF, and the uniformizing map uh, will again call it this zeta. And so we can sort of just um, compute similar exact formulas for these tower, bra tower graph T embedding and origami maps. And in terms of this uniformizing map, we again can get uh, these limiting formulas for the uh, T embedding and the origami map. And so again, and so these are the exact, actually the, it turns out that in this case, these are the exact same F and G as we had for the Aztec diamond case, which is actually not a surprise because the boundary conditions for our surface, we get the same surface. So we get the exact same F and G. So uh, again, we sort of clearly, as a corollary of what uh, we, we said before, we get a maximal surface, and uh, the complex structure we get from that is compatible with the known complex structure describing the Gaussian free field. Uh, okay, so here's just a picture of uh, T emitting of a tower graph. Uh, here's the origami map, compressed up here, living in, yeah almost living in a one-dimensional segment. And here's the uh, uh, sort of after shifting and rotating the origami map, here's the surface. Okay, and now, yeah, hopefully, yeah, I guess like probably a little bit early, but yeah, I just wanna show some, some simulations and give some uh, directions for future work. Okay, here's a picture of the hexagon. So if you consider like, lo like lozenge tilings, uniformly random lozenge tilings of a hexagon, here's the perfect T embedding of that domain, corresponding by Partite graph. So yeah. So why, why, is it, why is it like wavy, like a pattern? Uh, like, yeah, like, like over here? No, no, just, just like next step, closer to the bulk. Yeah. So if you zoom into the bulk, you presumably have kind of a regular hexagon lattice, is that right? That's right, yeah. So if you zoom in in the middle, you have like a regular hexagonal lattice. But if you go like over here, it won't be quite as much. It's kind of something interesting in the bottom of this picture. That kind of diamonds, which are kind of periodically being repeated. These things? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's a diamond and there's a next one, but not right. 
Right. So maybe, maybe it's right. So okay, maybe it's useful to say what parts of the picture correspond to what in the original picture. So this part corresponds to the tangency point. So this is like where you'd see GUE. So the embedding is kind of like not converging in some sense. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, there's some. Uh, <coughs> where's the frozen region in this picture? Where's the frozen region? Right. So the frozen regions are being collapsed. So there's six frozen regions in the regular hexagon. Uh, maybe I should draw a picture. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? In the That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so the frozen regions are, are being entirely collapsed to single vertices. So there's six frozen regions, and they're being collapsed to these six uh, vertices. Yeah, under this uh, under this map. And right, and so. So this part is being mapped to one corner. This part is being mapped to one corner entirely. And then if I just make a little, like a little arc around the tangency point, then I'll go across this entire edge of the embedding. That's what it looks like. Yes? How, how do we produce? Uh, so we were able to get some formulas. So I mean, this is like, I just numerically inverted the Castellane matrix and then, uh, but ultimately, like we have analytic formulas for those. Yeah. Yes. So you mentioned that it's like just a uniform, uniform edge weights, right? Yes. But here, the edge length. I was saying that this is gauge equivalent. The this edge weighting is gauge equivalent to the uniform. Yes, one. that's right. So we just compute. We're able to just compute the gauge functions f and g here. Yeah. The correct gauge functions, which give you actually the the right boundary conditions. Yes. So, yes. so if you have. A so if I ask that diamond, what is the domain after the T, after your algorithm map? Is it the same domain or different, not simply connected domain? After the origami map? Yeah, what's the, what's, what's the domain looks like? The, oh, of the Aztec? So if you have a, if I have a square region, you have Aztec diamonds? Yes. After origami map, what is the new domain? What does the new domain look like? The new domain after the origami map. So it's going to look like this, so... That's like this, uh, yeah, like all, the, all of this graph here, if I apply the origami map to that, it gets folded up into all that. So there's, all of those edges are being compressed into that little piece there. Oh, okay, so it's like, all right, so, it, it, so, so, so there's some, some, some microscopic region near those edges, which are blank, which are not, nothing mapped to there. Is that what you mean or not? Or is this still a, a, a square so, so, so what I'm saying is that the, the image of all these, the origami map is some map on this picture, and the image of all these edges uh, is, is this stuff here. Okay. That collapses it down to a one-dimensional subset. That's right. Can I add to, to explain how this connects to the right picture, which, I mean, I was, I was asking them several times. Now I got a better answer. So if you introduce a coordinate along the blue thing and just assign this coordinate as the height on the right picture, that would be the correct height. Yeah. should say that. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Leo. Thank you. Yeah. In the hexagon case, does yeah. the origami map collapse also to one-dimensional? Yes, yeah, it does. It does. You get, yeah, it does. It does. Um, OK. OK, here's the surface. So yes, yeah, so you get a one-dimensional. As you said, origami. Here's the surface. has six edges. It's a maximal surface. There's a similar, yeah, similar formula in the limit uh, in terms of two holomorphic functions, f and g, similar parameterization. Uh, and OK, so another question is to study what happens in the case when there are gaseous facets. So uh, local behavior of uh, the Darwin model can be in one of three phases. It can be in the liquid phase, the frozen phase, or the gaseous phase. And so if we change the weights on the Aztec diamond, as we've seen in many talks, then we can start seeing this gaseous, gaseous facet appear. And so the question is, how do the embeddings look uh, when there's a gaseous facet? So do they sort of behave in a natural way, I guess, is one question. All right, and so, OK, here's a picture. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> So, uh, okay, yeah. So here's an embedding 
of a Nasdaq diamond, which has this as its Arctic, Arctic boundary. So there's two gaseous facets, and maybe it's not clear what's happening in this picture, but so again, the frozen regions are being collapsed to these four points, and these gaseous facets are now being collapsed to points in the interior of the domain. So they're sort of like singularities. So if I graphed the surface here, then you would see, and that's what was on the title side, you'd see like two sort of like singularities there in the surface. Is this, like, would I rotate one of these? So, I mean, yeah, I guess the Aztec diamond, yeah. as, this is rotated from how I was yeah, drawing the Aztec diamond before. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. But, like, on the left, they were on the vertical axis, so on the right, these two, these two gazes are not on the vertical axis anymore? Yeah, they, they, they are. There was some symmetry. It seems that there is some symmetry on the left picture, right? But it's kind of disappeared on the right picture. Mm. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, but the symmetry, I'd have to think for a second. I mean, this is two by three weights. I'd have to think. Uh, but I think it's, I mean, from simulation, it looks like the other right? I think this, the right picture is the same, same type of weights as the left picture, right? The same type of weights. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So the sim there is some symmetry that's breaking. Right, but then the embedding doesn't appear. Yeah, so I guess there. Are... But that doesn't mean that maybe then there is a second solution, which is somehow you know, if you take the picture on the right and you just flip it vertically. Right. So right. Is yeah. Another yeah. perfect uh, embedding. I don't know. Yeah. So maybe if you choose a different like perfect boundary condition, so there's like this symmetry group. Maybe if you choose the right boundary condition, it would be symmetric. Right. So for uniform, clearly like the square is sort of like the natural like symmetric choice, but here maybe a different. Symmetric. Yeah. If you take this axis. Uh, but yeah, maybe not quite, right? I don't know. They're a little off-center, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> How important is your boundary condition? If you have a, a graph in the in the whole plane, and then origami map will map to another graph in the whole plane. Mm -hmm. Or the image of a, a graph in the whole plane will be mapped to a graph in the whole plane. Yeah, it'll, map to, it'll map to something. The origami map? Yeah. It'll map to something. <laughs> it's not a graph in the whole thing. Yeah, it's some, some graph. It'll map to some other graph. In this case, it's organic map also one dimensional, right? Oh, right. Yeah, so, so, so no, in, in this case, it, it's, it's actually not one dimensional. Okay, so you're predicting it. Oh, this is not the origami. There's no origami. Map. There's no origami here. Yeah, yeah no origami. It's just the embedding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. You said there was a singularity in the surface. How do you hope to get it? See, so yeah, it behaves like uh, so like the slope of so the surface is like space like, and then so it's like sort of looks like that. But then near the near the singularity, your slope is approaching uh, like the null direction. Right. But if you have a graph in the whole plane, the t embedding will be the the t graph will be in the in the whole plane as well. All oh, right, let's just, let's discuss after. Oh. I am happy to discuss after, but yeah, let's, right. it's just not a good time. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, oh yeah, okay. Okay, so yeah, as was mentioned, uh, it would be very nice if there was a variational principle describing T embeddings. There are variational principles for similar, in some sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that there are, similar, there are variational principles for very similar types of graph embeddings for circle patterns. Uh, Right, but so, but for in this particular setup, uh, there's not none of those uh, apply. And then, of course, the another question which was also brought up is, do perfect team meetings exist in general? It's sort of a big, big question. And also, like, does perfectness actually guarantee? Yes. So, is perfectness the right condition to impose? And does it does it guarantee these two like? Regularity conditions, and so is it sort of is it sufficient to find perfect T embeddings? Then do you get a general proof of GFF? It's sort of another question. Like, is that the right approach? And uh, okay, I wrote this actually in a, in a in a terrible way, but attempting conjecture is that this, this capital F corresponds to a holomorphic function little f, and this capital G corresponds to a holomorphic function little g, and that you have this convergence, this type of convergence. Um, so I don't know. This is sort of a tempting, like, sort of general, general conjecture. Okay. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Thank you.